So once again, I'm Mike. Um, I usually work in the sort of data science field, crunching numbers and this kind of thing. But today I thought it would be nice to do a uh, talk about a particular hobby and passion of mine, which is um, computer graphics. So in fact, the reason I got into programming originally was um, back in the 1980s, I, I, I saw these, some of these programs that could actually create graphical images using maths. And I was totally hooked and I just wanted to, uh, to, to do that myself. And I think my first ever graphics program was something that drew a circle on the screen using sines and cosines and, and plotting the pixels around. And I was so happy about that that, you know, I was just hooked on programming ever after. Um, so obviously nowadays we can do a lot more interesting things with computer graphics. So I'm going to talk about a particular topic, which is, I think, very interesting, which is a procedural graphics generation. Yeah. And Clojure turns out to be a fantastic language for doing that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk through a bit about procedural uh, procedural content generation, some of the ideas in it, then talk about, okay, then how do you do it in Clojure? And I've got a, an open source library, um, and I'll explain a bit about what that can do, and then hopefully do a bit of live, live coding at the end. Um, how much time do I have, roughly? An hour. An hour, fantastic. Okay, we can do lots of, we can do lots of uh, coding and questions and stuff like that, and actually dig into a bit of the detail of how it works. Okay, so um, procedural content generation. Basically, it's, 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 the programmatic generation of content. So instead of hiring an artist who has to, you know, draw all these beautiful sprites or, 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 or painting on their graphics tablet, we're actually going to get the computer to do the work of generating images, yeah, using code. And uh, typically this incorporates some random or pseudo-random processes in order to get these sort of natural sort of looks. And it's got a bunch of different applications, yeah. So, um, one of the things is actually creating textures. Yeah, so the kind of textures you see in computer games, often they're generated with some of these kind of techniques. Uh, you can do it for abstract art, just creating things that look beautiful. Um, you can do it with um, music. So what the stuff you apply to graphics can also create sound. And there's been a lot of progress recently in um, actually creating reasonable sounding music from some of these techniques. Um, you can also use it for game content. So one of the Classic examples of procedural generation is creating maps. Yeah, if you want to have random maps in some of these dungeon games, roguelike games, this kind of thing. And you can actually use it to create whole virtual worlds. So there was a game released last year, I think, called No Man's Sky. It had an entire universe generated procedurally with billions of different, uh, different worlds and galaxies. There's no way a human designer could ever create all of this content. So having me able to automatically generate it on the fly when the player flies into a particular planetary system is you know, an amazing way of actually creating a huge world without having to manually craft all of that. Um, but today we'll talk about particularly image generation. Yeah? So we're going, to be, we're, going to be generating, so we're going to be generating some images. And uh, they're 2D images. So we basically got an x-axis and a y-axis, and the task, if you like, the problem to solve is what color we, are we gonna put in each individual pixel? So for every single point in that image, we, we've gotta generate a color, red, green, blue, et cetera. If we do that for each pixel, then we end up with some kind of, some kind of, some kind of image. And hopefully we're gonna do it in an intelligent way so we get a nice image that we like. So um, one of the key ideas here is that if you wanna make a more interesting image, you have to combine different uh, things together. Yeah, so one of the one of the concepts here is the idea of composition. So in exactly the same way that you're in a functional programming language, you're going to compose functions. We can actually think, okay, what happens if we combine images? Yeah. So if you've got a function that produces the image on the um, on the left and a function that produces the image on the right, then you can actually combine them together. So one of the things when you do, you can multiply them. Yeah. So if you multiply black, if black is zero, think of black as being zero and white as being one. Uh, if you multiply those things together, you get actually the, the grating pattern applied to the underlying image. And that's going to be very important later on. The idea of each of these things is actually a, almost like a function. So natural idea, we would, let's use a functional language to do some of this. So... Um, I created this open source library. It's called CLISC, the Closure Image Synthesis Kit. Uh, it's all on GitHub, so you, you, know, you can all go and check it out and uh, download it and play with it, all open source. Um, it's using, obviously, Clojure as an open source language. And there's actually a, you know, almost an open source recipes of how to create some of these, some of these images. 
And a nice example of this is um, a guy called Roger Allen took this, this library and turned it into a, a Twitter bot called Tweegee Me. Yeah? And it creates all of these weird and fantastic um, images. And it does it not by any sort of manual um, process, but by uh, genetic algorithms. So the images almost get bred together. It turns out actually that's quite easy to do in, cl cl in Clojure, because if you think about the syntax of Clojure, a form with different components, it's almost like an abstract syntax tree. And then you can use genetic algorithms to swap and replace those different branches of the tree. And that's how, the, how TreeGME evolves these images. Obviously, evolution needs a little bit of input, so TreeGME takes face uh, likes or retweets and uses those to sort of feed the, uh, the algorithm. So if you, like a, if you like a particular kind of image, it's going to create more images with those kind of components and those kind of things. So here's some, here's some examples of things that just came out of TreeGME. It's been running for, I think, a couple of two or three years now, so there's thousands and thousands of different images. And what you can see is that several of the images look similar. They've got like similar themes. So at this point, it's discovered a rainbow pattern, and that's been merged into a couple of the other images. This one, it's got sort of like a, a sort of solid block color scheme. This one, it's discovered a sort of plasma cloudy-like thing. So it sort of explores combinations along the lines of these, of these images. Um, someone else did another one called Clevolution, another one of these algorithms that does uh, that evolves, and it creates some different kinds of images. So that they both sort of find different kinds of concepts. Okay. Uh, so just an example of the kind of things you can do with this. Of course, you can also manually craft these 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 syntax trees if you're trying to get a particular kind of effect, and we'll do a bit of that later. Okay. Um, so. First of all, I always think that when you're working on these kind of things, building these kind of libraries, you want to make the basic interface to get something up and running really, really simple. Yeah? So we just have a show command at the REPL, and you say, I want to show some, some tree, some definition of an image. Simplest, well, one of the simplest things you can possibly do is uh, something like show x00. So I just want to stop and quickly explain the syntax so that uh, the other examples become clear. Um, this is basically the definition of the image generator. And what we're saying is there's three channel, channels, red, green, and blue, to create the image. And we want the first channel to be X, the second channel to be zero, and the third channel to be zero. Yeah? So red is going to be defined by X, green and blue are both going to be zero. When that translates into the, into the, into the image, um, X is varying from naught to one. Y is varying from 0 to 1. So as X increases, you increase the amount of red. Yeah? Uh, y isn't, doesn't appear in the, in the image definition, so you don't, you don't get any variation going down the Y axis. It's just a, it's just a, a constant, constant gradient. Make sense? OK. Um, so obviously, if you put in, you can put in a green channel. Yeah? So if you put uh, Y as the green channel, then now you're getting variation along the y-axis, and the green comes in this way, and obviously you go this way, you've combined red and green, so you get, you get yellow. Um, so a couple of points is um, these, these sort of CLIS... Um, yeah, so the, the CLIS functions, the, the, these sort of definitions, are actually generating something like an AST, yeah, and when CLISC actually generates images, what it's doing is it's almost like a little compiler, and it's taking these ASTs and it's turning it into um, s some more efficient closure code. Yeah, and it basically looks the, the actual code looks something like this. It's doing do times y for the height of the image, so it's looping from naught to y, do times x for the width, so it's looping across that, and then it's creating. A bunch of code, so doing some code generation uh, that actually is the code that calculates the color for any given x and y, and then it's effectively doing a set RGB on a Java buffered image, so you actually get the the color the the, the pixel set in the image. Okay, and Clojure is actually great for this because it does make this it does make this pretty pretty simple process to to work. Um, 
the actual one of the challenges of course is making it efficient but we can talk a bit more about that later um, so one of the things CLISC does is it has a bunch of different primitives yeah, which are the things you can actually use to, um, to mix in and create, create the image. So if you just set constant colors, 0 0.1, 0 0.7, 1.0, you'll get, a, you'll get a, nice, a nice blue and it's a constant color. So you've got no X's and Y's appearing in the formula. It's just going to be flat. Uh, there's a few primitives which are designed to, you know, just be commonly used. So stuff like checker want to check a checkerboard checkerboard pattern um, you can do texture maps so if you've got any image you want to uh, load in you can that's just the closure closure logo um, uh, you can import those and, and use and use that kind of thing um, and it gets more interesting is when you sort of look at some of the transformations you can apply to these primitives so for an example is uh, scaling yeah so you can have a, a checkerboard of just red and pink if I scale it by 0 0.3, it's going to shrink that checkerboard, so you get more of the uh, more of the checkers in the in the space of the space of the image. And this is this is like a higher order function, yeah. So the scale is transforming whatever else you put inside it, and and, and giving you a um, the ability to sort of compose these primitives together. Um, you can also do offsets, which is just shifting the image to the side or or up or down. Um, yeah, the more interesting one is, is warps, yeah? So instead of just simply doing an offset or a scale or one of these simple transformations, you can say, actually, I want to take one function and use it to change the X and Y coordinates that are being used. So this is a real, this is, I, I can, I have trouble getting my head around this all the time, yeah? But basically you're saying that instead of using the X and Y on the image, you're gonna put that X and Y through another transformation and then use that in the other, in the other generator. And this is probably the most powerful uh, of the uh, compositions. So what it's saying in this case is, well, I wanna start with a checker of red and pink, but then I'm gonna warp the X's and Y's around. And as you can see, you're getting red and pink from all different angles. Yeah, because it's sort of like transforming the space. So it's effectively, I call it warp because it, it's sort of warping space, space-time, if you like. Um, one of the other sort of helpful things is um, often when you're trying to create textures, you want, um, you want things to look a little bit realistic. And realistic textures uh, have randomness in them. Yeah, if you think about tree bark or the texture of stone or um, clouds, these kind of things. So some of the most important tools to do that is this idea of noise. Yeah, so there's these um, noise functions. Um, so we have monochromatic noise, and it sort of looks like, it sort of looks like a slightly blurry pic picture of, 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 of dots. And it's got bright spots and dark spots. And these are pseudo-random, yeah? So the reason you want pseudo-random is if you just put totally random, you get like um, a mess of different colors, yeah? You want randomness, but it, you want it to move smoothly, yeah? So that you, can, uh, you, can, you don't get these sudden jumps and you get, it'll just like look like white noise on a broken TV if you have, have completely, complete randomness. And the other reason it's pseudo-random is you want to be able to repeat this, yeah? So if you imagine if you're doing an animation, it's no good if the dots come in completely different places every time because it'll make the animation look, look like it's just, it's just like, um, I should have done a video, but you'd get this effect of like the animation sort of just flashing around and it, it, nothing ever being in the right place. So if you want things to animate smoothly, you have to use pseudo-random noise that has, has these sort of smooth <coughs> gradient functions. Um, so you've got the monochromatic noise, you've got vector noise which is just the same kind of noise function but in the red green and blue channels simultaneously and you also get these interesting I, I, lo I love these ones called plasmas and the plasmas are actually fractal noise so it's the same effect as if you took the monochromatic noise you have a big a big wave of noise um, and then you add to that a, a lower freq uh, sorry a higher frequency noise with 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 sort of closer together peaks and you add a, then a much more high frequency noise 
and you add a few of these layers together, so five or six levels of it, and you get this sort of cloudy plasma effect, which is very nice for you know, certain, kinds of, certain kinds of textures, Na particularly natural textures, because a lot of nature has these sort of fractal properties. Okay, so I actually wanted to go to um, do some live coding. Well, I'll just show you a couple of the... Um... Oh, let's, get, let's, go, let's go coding. Okay. All right, so let me... Hopefully this all works. It's, you know, it's technology, so I, 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 can't, I can't, um, can't always guarantee it. Does that look okay? Can people see that? It's quite hard to make Eclipse have big enough text and also and also be able to uh, 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 be visible so this is this is um, a sort of sample sample na namespace I just run through some examples and we can sort of play with the examples uh, if you want to try things out yeah let's make this interactive just say hey can you do X and then we'll 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 we'll, we'll see how it works um, so basically the let's start with the most simple thing if we just want to show a single color we have show 100. What's that going to be? Red. red. Correct. Yeah, so it's going to be uh, flat red. Um, that's a bit simple. Um, let's say we. Um, the next one is um, as we think about these sort of vectors of red, green, and blue, you can also have scalars. Yeah, so a scalar is just a normal normal number. The way the way I've done it, it's a bit um, weakly typed here in the sense that you can either have a vector or or a scalar as an as an argument. If you put in a scalar as an argument on its own, so if I say just say show zero point five, it interprets that for every channel. Yeah, so red, green, and blue all get zero point five assigned. So you get a nice grey, which is exactly the same, of course, as separating it out separately but it's just it's a it's a short it's a shorthand um for doing that um we have named colors so you can show pink yeah just a you know just a utility functions for people who who are sort of being creative with this um we put in the variables so show that's the one we had earlier just just having a an, an x y naught um let's let's just have a play with this one then so if we um if we let's let's do uh uh v star 3x so i multiplied it by three here yeah so x is now instead of going from naught to one is going from naught to three and this shows you what happens when one of the channels caps it um it it actually just truncates at one yeah you can't we can't currently display colors colors brighter than uh, um, brighter than one. So anyway, so that's the first third of the screen, and then up here it's going up to three, but it's just it's just truncated, um, clamped at at a, at, a, at a value of one. Okay. Um, yeah, it's just same with same with green. Um, this is how you do the addition. So if you're trying to, um, we're getting now into the first um, combinators. Yeah. So um, I called them V plus, V star uh, to avoid the name clash because you actually want to use star and plus when you're actually doing calculations. So I had to give them a different, different name in order to make this, this work um, uh, logically. But plus would have been the one, one I'd have used if it weren't for that. Um, so that's a plus. I've added together the X and, X and Y um, gradients to get, the, to get this image. Which is, of course, the same as just showing x, y, zero. No need to do that. Um, multiplication. Yeah. So again, the same same thing. If you multiply these, scale these things up, you're going to get um, you're going to get the sort of truncation happening. Okay. So let's let's get into actually what these things are. So we're actually creating these things called nodes, which are the AST nodes, which 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 um, produce these images. So um, let's say we want we we say okay instead of showing I'm just going to actually generate a node with x x y and zero so x y and zero here is um, just a closure vector but we need to turn it into an AST so if I do node x y zero 
I get this little data structure, yeah? So it's type is a vector, so it's recognized that it's going to have multiple, multiple channels. You could, the other type would be a scalar, if it's just a single number. Um, the code for each of the uh, things is just x, y, and 0, which is taken out of the vector. Uh, objects is nil, and it's importantly, and this is important for performance, it's analyzed it and said it's not constant. Yeah, constant would be if it was 1, 2, 3, or something like that, but because you've got an x and y in there, it's going to say it's not constant. This is important later because some operations are going to get much faster if you, um, if you can realize that they're constant and don't try and recalculate them for every, every <coughs> pixel. The objects is um, it's a bit of an internal implementation detail, but um, in Clojure, you can't easily pass around binary objects in forms, I found out. You know, lots of various things behave slightly weirdly. So um, if you were to put in something like a buffered image, yeah, it um, stores it in here, in this objects field, yeah, which can then get passed down the AST. So at the, at the root of the AST, you might have 10 different buffered images that you're, you're combining. So this is, the, this is like a set of objects that gets accumulated. In this case, we don't have it. So what, what, what it then does is, let's say we have, let's, let's say we have that same node, there's a little code generator. So let me just run this one. So I'm going to run code gen on, um, on that node. And what it's generated is a let statement. Yeah, and it's, this is something I actually need to tidy up still. It's generating some temporary variables. Yeah, because sometimes you're generating many different X's and many different Y's in different part of the formula. So you have to make sure they don't clash. Um, it's creating a let statement, and at this point it's setting z to 0, because we said we didn't want any z. It's setting um, x to the x temporary variable and y to the y temporary variable, and z to the z temporary variable, and then in this case not, not, not necessary. And then it's calling um, a little function called to argb, um, which is taking the three double values. So everything's done in doubles internally, yeah, uh, floating point. And it's converting that into, a, um, into an ARGB encoded um, int, effectively, which is what you need to actually put into the buffered image. Yeah? So this basically gets inserted in a, inside, a, inside a, a loop, and then the, the, when you're actually doing the rendering. Yeah? So this is actually the actual code that gets that gets put in. Um, from a performance perspective, um, if you want this to perform well, all of the X's, all of the Y's need to be double floating point. Yeah? If you'd start doing that with closure um, object, with objects, yeah, so using the regular plus, plus minus star and objects, and closure then has to do um, you know, sort of dynamic analysis of what, what, what kind of object it is. It has to do the type, type analysis whenever you use the standard closure.core plus. So you want to keep it in double so that this actually gets compiled down into the actual JVM efficient byte, byte code. Um, it still works, in fact, but it, it, will, it, go, it will go 10, 10 to 20 times slower <coughs> if, you, if, you, if you don't manage to get everything into doubles. Um, so yeah, slightly more complicated one. Yeah, so in this one, for example, it's, you can see how it's, it's converted the V star, which was the vector multiplication. It's actually converted that into two separate uh, closure.core multiplications, one for, each, one for each channel. Yeah, so part of the, the job of the AST nodes is to know which uh, underlying functions in closure or there's a few custom functions you actually want to translate the code into. Um, got some predefined patterns. Oops. Doesn't help if I don't include both brackets. Yep, so the sort of the checker, checker pattern, this kind of thing. Um, is this making or making sense? sense to everyone. If you want to try anything, by the way, do, do shout out. Yeah, we can, uh, we can um, 
checker black white um, this is okay this is this is this is nice so this is looking at um, again function function composition yeah so checker isn't just for two colors you can use it for any other arbitrary any other node any other sort of uh, generator so here instead of just check uh, doing a checker with two colors we're going to say actually we're going to put a, a smaller checker inside inside a bigger inside a bigger checker so you get something you get something like this yeah um, that's just an example of offsetting the same thing yeah so offsets another you know one of these functions functions you can use um, ah okay this is this is interesting. So um, it's applying the same principle. Yeah, anywhere, anywhere in CLISC you can use a number. You can also use an X or a Y or another, another function. Yeah. So here for our offset, we're not just going to use a constant offset, which just has the, the, the effect of shifting up and down. We're going to say we're going to offset by 0.3 times Y and on the x-axis and naught on the um, on the uh, on the y-axis. Yeah. So same thing. Now this has an effect of adding a skew. Yeah. So as you go down the screen, you're increasing the x-offset. Um, let me just see if this works. I think. Uh, Can anyone remember how to do a rotation? It's, it's, this, is, this, is like going, this is like stretching my brain going back to all of my uh, matrix, matrix um, geometry. Um, but I think, it's, I think it's you do a minus of the same thing. This might not work. Yeah. Yeah, so, you've, you've, so if you... If you if you if you apply your you, your geometry to this, you can start getting all kinds of uh, different uh, effects. Let me see. Okay. And I'm, I'm trying really hard to break it. I'm going to see if I can uh, if I can put a bit of animation on this. So, animation. We basically want to make sure that we're changing some of the variables as you as you go on. Yeah. So, um, in this case, we'll have a, a variable like an i, um, which is going to increase from 0 to 100. Um, we're going to want to change these numbers. Yeah. So the 0 0.3 and the minus 0 0.3. I think it's going to be something like sine i times 0 0.05 i and it's something like minus sine times Five, Live coding. I've never done this before, so I've got no idea what's going to do. I know. You... Maths sign. It's probably math sign, isn't it? Anyone remember if closure imports math by default? Okay, so it's. It's got a bit of flicker because it's not like it's not designed for you know uh, real time animation really. But you can see it's pretty fast. Yeah, that's that's re that's each of those was basically a f entire frame um, rendering. Um, so you can actually create little animations with with, with this as well. Um, okay. Of course, you can use your sine waves. Um, so there's actually a vector sine function, which in the uh, v, the v sine, which is a sine node, which creates sine waves in the in the in the thing. Uh, 
oh sorry that's just defining it yes so this is an example of again using using closure to sort of you know, plug and play these components that's defining a thing called a sine wave um, maybe we can show it show sine wave I think it's just very because it's. I think it's just very, very. Um, it's very, very dark. Yeah, that's too big. V star ten. Yeah, um, I'm not quite sure why, but it was very, very dark. I could just see on my screen. I could just see a very, very slight variation in 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 in, in the grey. And that's one of the things you run into quite a few times when you're experimenting this is sometimes the colors are either too, big, too, um, too dark or too bright and it saturates or you, your scaling is way too big and the entire thing gets you know, squashed to some, you know, um, some things. So you have to sort of sometimes experiment a bit with, these, with, the, with the scales. But that's a sine wave, yeah? you're getting the sort of hump effect. And because it's, it's going negative at these points, so it's just, it's just being truncated to black. Um, so you can then use that sine wave as a building block for your, 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 other, your other patterns. So in this case, um, it's using sine wave for uh, an offset. Any, uh, so it's using sine wave as an offset for our checker pattern. Anyone got a guess on what it's going to look like? Going like a wavy one like that. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So basically, the it's the sine wave. Instead of using the sine wave to generate a color, as we just 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 did just showed it before, we're using the sine wave to generate the offset. So again, you can, this is one of these examples of variable variable offsets. Um, oh, this is. Um, a very useful feature. So one of the th one of the th one of the things about the red, green, and blue um, concept of of colors and channels is it's great for computers. Yeah, that's what actually needs to get pumped out to the display, and it's very easy to do maths with it because you know it's, it almost follows linear logic. Problem is that's not actually very good for artists. Yeah, artists hate RG RGB colors because they're they're not. How people how people perceive and think and think about um, uh, uh, color in general. So a much more intuitive way is to use a um, different color space, like hue, hue, saturation, and lightness. So Clisk has got a whole bunch of different functions which convert between different color spaces. Um, so if you take, if you were to generate something uh, a, a pattern in the hue, saturation, and lightness space, and then convert it to RGB, you get a you get some quite different effects. So this is RGB from HSL. So it's taking HSL and turning it into, into RGB. The HSL is doing X, Y, and 0.5, yeah? Now when you convert it into RGB, you get this, yeah? So um, that is basically the hue, hue dimension increasing. Yeah, so you're basically going around a color wheel. Naught to one is basically the same as going one, one circuit of the color wheel. And going from the bottom to the top, that's the, um, that's the saturation. Yeah, so you're going from uh, fully saturated. No, that's fully saturated. I forget which it is. One of them is fully saturated. You're going from gray, basically, which I think is fully saturated. Who knows? Uh, you're going from grey to pure colour, yeah, as you go from the top to the bottom of the, the screen. Um, you can, if you want to do it with lightness instead, um, so instead of changing, oops, instead of changing the saturation with the Y, let's keep the saturation at one, I guess. We can put the Y in there. Yeah, and now we get the lightness varying. So you're going from black, which is zero, zero lightness, to 
pure color, which is 0.5 lightness, to white, which is 100% lightness. Okay. Um, textures. So here's a here's a picture of a cannon I took in uh, Malacca. Um, so that's just a normal regular image. You know, you can you can you can uh, um, just import whatever you want. Um, you can you can do every transport anything you can do with the um, anything you can do with any of the other um, functions. You can do with images as well. So okay, here's a here's an example. It's a hue adjustment. Yeah. So what we're going to do is we're going to adjust the hue, saturation, and lightness using the x coordinate. Any any guesses on what that one looks like? Here we go. You get a rainbow cannon, yeah? So what's happening here is as you go along the x-axis, it is shifting the hue um, to, and, it, and you, get, you, get, you, get, you, get, you get this kind of, kind, kind of effect. to show you sort of how easy it is to sort of create your own high order functions and, and this kind of thing. Let's say you wanted, uh, this one's a flip, I call it flip. Um, so it's a regular closure, regular closure function. What it's gonna do is it's gonna take one parameter, which is a node, and it's going to um, warp that node, yeah? And the warp is going to change the y to an x and then the x to a y. So if it was x, y here, it wouldn't do anything at all because it's just using x as x and y as y. Here it's saying I want to use y for the x and x for the, x for the y. And what that's going to do, oops, need to run that. Helps if you define your functions before you use them. It's going to swap the x, x and y axis effectively. So any of any of any any kind of transformation you want to do, you can sort of define you can sort of define as a as a regular closure function. Uh, some noise. So this I, I showed some noise patterns earlier. Uh, that's just a regular regular sort of noise. Um, so you can do lots of you can do lots of fun stuff with noise. I mean, if you want. Um, Oh, that's the that's the that's the vector noise. Um, so um, so if you imagine that this is sort of like um, going from zero to one in sort of a sort of a smooth pattern. Um, sometimes you want just patches of noise, yeah. So to like create a like let's say you're doing something like if you imagine like tree tree bark or something like that with little patches of moss. You can use moss. You can use the noise functions to create to create that kind of thing. So you often want it not to be not to be positive in all places. Um, so you could do something like um, you could subtract from it. Yeah. So it, it'll it'll go down and um, hit zero. So um, v minus. So if I just take away 0 0.5 from the noise. Yeah, you're just going to get these little these little patches because I basically reduce the noise, and, and everywhere it's dropping below zero, it's just disappearing and turning turning into black. Um, you can obviously combine it with images and stuff like that. So here, you know, you can use the um, uh, so that's the that's the vector noise, so the coloured noise, and just just overlaying it on the uh, overlaying it on the cannon. What I will show is I'll show if you. If you take noise and really scale it out, why didn't that work? Yeah. Yeah. 
So if you really scale out noise, it starts to look more like just completely random noise and it gets something like a sort of a, a TV, TV screen thing. Um, I think... Um, Um, the plasma noise, so the fractal noise, is sort of like this kind of thing. Um, so this is, you can sort of see the fractal effect slightly here. You've got like these sort of light patches. So remember I said how, how you're adding together noise of different, um, different wavelengths. The big wavelength noise is probably causing this light patch here this light patch here and the dark patch here. And then the smaller wavelength noise is what's creating these sort of like small little, little um, perturbations in the, in, in, in the color. Um, noise is interesting because um, you can use it for lots of different things. You can use it for um, offsets. Oops. Yeah, so if you use noise as an offset, you get this sort of uh, effect of like, um, I think it's like some wet, looking through wet glass or something, something like that. It's basically just distorting the image differently at different points, which is the kind of effect optically you'd get if you had water of different depths uh, causing different uh, refractions. Um, <coughs> a fun thing you can do with this, and it's a slightly more complicated example, is you can use it to create landscapes. Yeah, so these, these kind of plasma-based noise is actually very similar to the... Uh, height contours you would typically typically see in landscapes so if you take that principle and you say okay we're going to build um, a height contour you can actually create these sort of these sort of fractal landscape type things Oops. <coughs> yep a bit slow that one yeah so it's a slightly more complicated example yeah what we're actually using is we're using the noise the plasma noise as a, as a, as a height map where um, so these, are, these will be like the highest points, the uh, little s snow-capped mountains. Um, whenever the noise is going below uh, 0.5 or the, mid the midpoint, we're sort of saying that's going to be C. So we're colouring it to a shade, of, a shade of blue. And it's actually using a, a map of different colours. So rather than saying, OK, I just want to go from black to red or sort of a very sort of algorithmically designed thing actually I chose these colors and I said I'm gonna have a color spectrum which goes from a dark a very dark blue to a lighter blue then it suddenly jumps to a yellow for a very small amount to give you sort of slight beach effect then you get for a longer period it's, it's some shades of green then it goes into some some browns and um, and ultimately white for your sort of snow caps so this is this is where you start combining the algorithm with your sort of creative judgment on you know how much of different colors do you want how do you actually want the thing to the thing to come up yeah so it's a great prototyping tool yeah if you're just trying to you know quickly try out different things like um uh, Let's say landscape map Z. Um, colors, colors. Sunset map, okay. Bright colorful map, desert map. Lan so that's a landscape map, yeah? So it's saying, um, I want a color map. Zero is going to, z 0, 0, 0 0.5 is a dark, darkish blue. 0.3 is going to 0, 0, 0, 0.8, which is a bit of a lighter blue. So those basically are the colors that that, that landscape um, does. But let's say we can have, have a desert map instead, if we like. It's a bit slow, yeah. So that's a different that's a, di a different color map. So you can just you you can play around with these things and uh, get different sort of effects coming out. Um, another nice thing with these plasmas, if you use 
plasmas. So there it was. Um, oh, one other, one other thing I should just say about this one. Um, there is, it says render lit, like for rendering, for the, the sort of shadows and the effect. You saw the mountain look, um, let me just run it again. You can see how it sort of slightly looks like it's got shadows on this, so you can sort of see the dark side of the mountain and the light side of the mountain. This is not a renderer. It is not remotely capable of, of, of doing light, lighting calculations or anything like that. It's not a ray tracer. Um, so how is it actually creating that sort of textured shading effect? Um, actually, it's a, it's a trick, yeah? What it's doing is um, it's sampling the plasma at, very, at uh, two very, very close points. And it's, seeing the, it's working out the gradient of the plasma, like how fast the plasma map is going up and down. And then it's using a, a very, very hacky transformation which approximates light reflection. Yeah, it's like a first order approximation of light reflection. You then add that to the color and you get something that looks like it's, it's being lit. Yeah, but it's a complete hack. It's just a little mathematical trick which is, which is producing that effect. Um, so yeah, so that's an example of using plasma for a height map and then using that height map both to produce the colors of the landscape and also the, uh, the rendering, so the, text, the, the, the sort of texture on the, on the, light, on the height map. Um, you can also use plasma for colors and I think this is a slightly crazy one. Yeah, so if you actually put plasma into your, I don't even know how this one works actually. Um, it's looping up, it's using a plasma to loop through another plasma and you get, you get nice colors out. It's sort of like a, makes me think of like the sort of some kind of multicolor fruity ice cream or something like that. Um, you may see something different. Um, yeah, one of my friends made this one. So again, that's using, that's using some noise and sort of distorting the color through, through, through plasmas and you get some sort of interesting swirly patterns. Um, and this one is of course a very famous, famous one. Um, probably all familiar with this. That's the, uh, the good old Mandelbrot set. Um, and you can do that with you can do that with the Clisk AST. Yeah, there's actually a very very primitive, but it works um, fractal function. Yeah, which says um, it's got a sort of termination condition. So while the length of the vector is less than two, it's going to update the position to this is actually sort of a mandible related formula something like z squared z squared plus c or something like that but it's got a real and imaginary component and then it's taking the result of that those iterations it's counting how many iterations it's 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 doing and uh, it's using a v plasma to sort of as a color so basically the color map oh, that could be a i think that could be a landscape map yeah, let's try that one sec. Uh, let me try. Uh, it's all C. Uh, So that color, the color I'm using here is the same as the, the, the map used for the landscape. So you can just, you can just lost the, lost the image. Um, and uh, there's a ba and there's a max iterations. Yeah. So if, if, if you want these things to compute, to finish in finite time, you ultimately need to stop iterating and, um, uh, I put it at 10,000 so it doesn't take forever. And then you can say a bailout color. So if you, 
don't actually reach the end, what colour do you want, you want the, the, the remaining part of the image to be? Yeah. So it's, 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 it's a bit hacky, you can't do ev every single possible factor with that, but you can do actually quite a lot of um, the sort of classic factual based images using that technique. And you see it's pretty fast, yeah? Um, so that actually all is getting optimised down to double, double based maths, otherwise it would be a bit, bit slower than that. Okay. Any questions about any of that? Yeah, sure. Can you modify the scene? The wish, sorry? When we run the landscape, <coughs> you always get the same result. Uh, yeah, okay, good. very good question. Um, so you want it to be different each time? Yeah. Or, okay, so... Or just different once. Or different once. Um, so, well, let's just... Let's just analyze how it's working, yeah? So it's using, it's using plasma as the, for the Z coordinate. Yeah, so this is this, let Z is this V plus with a plasma, yeah? So the ch we want a different plasma, yeah, in order to get a different, a different map. Um, now plasma is pseudo-random, yeah? It, it looks random, but it's actually it always will, if you look at the same part of the plasma, it's always going to come up with exactly the same result. Yeah? So in order to get different plasma, it's quite simple. You just need to look at a different part of the, part of the plasma yeah, somewhere else. Um, so let's just do, try this. If I do offset 100 plasma, should work. That's different, yeah? Yeah, um, let me, I'll just run it. What, remember, remember that image. Yeah. So, yeah, so basically you're sort of just moving around to different parts of the plasma and then you get, you get, a, you get a different landscape. But the seed doesn't come into the picture. Um, the seed for the plasma is fixed. Yeah. Um, it doesn't. I, just, I guess it doesn't have to be. But um, if you want to use a different, if you if you don't like the one you got, you just offset it. Yeah, to somewhere far into the distance, and then it's completely unrelated to the one you just had. Yeah. So effectively, you can use you're using the offset as a seed in order to get different images. <coughs> yeah. Good question though. Yeah. Because that's very important, yeah? If you artistically don't like what came out of the random number generator, you want to run your random number again. Yeah, so this is a, tr a trick for doing that. But you're right, actually. I, could probably, I should probably add a seed function in as well. I think the only thing that's slightly challenging about that is there's a bunch of pre-generated tables uh, used to create the noise. So you'd probably, for each seed, you'd probably have to reinitialize the tables, and you'd have to you'd have to play around, fiddle around with a bit of that kind of stuff, but it's not, it's not, it's not too hard. Yeah, certainly be possible. Can you hang over the landscape, like flying over the, the island? Um, the answer is yes. I was just about to do it, but I just thought how long it took to render there. Yeah. It, wouldn't, it wouldn't look good in real time. But yeah, all you'd be doing is you'd take your iteration counter and you'd be offsetting the the plasma, just like we just did, you'd be changing that offset over time. And yeah, you'd be, you can pan over the landscape, or you could change the scale as well and zoom in and right. zoom in and out. So yeah, it's um, it's uh, super flex. It's quite flexible on that kind of thing. You do have to. One of the, one of the things with this is you do have to know a bit of maths. Yeah, so you have to think of your geometry and offsets and scales and all of all of this kind of thing. So I guess it's a little bit niche. In that respect, it will appeal to programmer artists, but your average, you know, artist who doesn't have software or at least decent maths experience would have trouble using this tool. So, um, but hey, I did it because I love it rather than rather because I'm expecting it to be adopted by uh, artists worldwide. Um, I can sh do you want to see some more examples or, qu or okay? So how much time do we have? 
Up for the next speaker. Okay, cool. Well, if there's any more questions quickly or? Then all of topic, do you have any, any, or any suggestion for the similar library for closure script? I've not seen one. Um, I think this could be ported to ClojureScript. I don't see any fundamental barrier. Yeah, it could be. It's, that would be an interesting project, actually. I think you could basically convert most of it to CLJC. There will be complexities around the image handling. You'd probably, have to, you'd probably have to write that separately. And there'd be complexities around the sort of the wrapper, which is like... Um, creating the, the windows and stuff like that, you'd have to do it completely differently with the browser. But the core logic and the ASTs and the nodes, I think would translate pretty directly. Um, yeah, interesting, interesting idea. Yeah. Anything else? Okay, well, in the interest of time, I think, uh, um, thanks, thanks very much for listening. Hope, you, hope you've enjoyed, enjoyed that. Um, Obviously, if any more questions or if anyone wants to dive into the technical details of how uh, some of this works, then happy to, happy to chat later. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Cheers.